na chine ke na ke promi he nina onyo bo na nia na zopota onyo bo na nia bo opu ya nina bu ye na amen anyi we na ase eze ku pete nkosi na no tuto na ejama na nsopuru site na edige bimaru na edige ise 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 Welcome, my amazing viewers. Thank you so much for joining me on my program once again. I appreciate you wherever you are joining from. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please kindly subscribe to my channel. Click the notification bell so that you be notified each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you so much. And remember, blessed. if you are joining me from Africa, Asia, Europe, America, Australia, or any part of the world, I thank you very much for your contribution. Please, each time you watch my video, go to the comment section and put down your comments. That is where we learn from each other. We learn a lot from the comment section. I don't speak alone. I am speaking with you. You can equally contribute. You can criticize if you so desire, but do it constructively so that we can learn from one another. That is why we are here. Thank you so much for joining. Remember, you have to say what is happening in your own area. Whatever happens, if you see something, say something. Don't be silent. We cannot allow the conventional media to continue to change the narrative. We cannot allow the conventional media to continue to play down the situation. We will continue to bring the situation the way it is and say it straight the way it is without hating anybody. We are not preaching his speech. We are not talking down anybody. We say leave and let's leave. And for those who say we will not leave, just like the full Anisha Jawid have said, they will not leave either. Hello there and welcome. I am Imoni Amarere. This is People, Politics and Power. Nigeria has, for several years running, been challenged by agitations for self-determination by different groups. There is the now proscribed Indigenous Peoples of Biafra, IPOB, in the Southeast, and Yoruba Nation agitators in the Southwest. There is also the Nigerian Indigenous Nationalities Alliance for Self-Determination, a joint cooperation initiative of the Southern and Middle Belt peoples, amongst many others. While IPOB may have taken a violent path in its agitation, all the other self-determination movements have remained civil, yet the federal government has responded with strong armed tactics uh, to their agitations and demands. The result is that the self-proclaimed leader of IPOB is incarcerated and on trial for treason amongst other offenses. The self-styled leader of the Yoruba Nation Agitators is detained in Kotonou, Benin Republic, after escaping arrest in Nigeria. Several appeals and calls on the central government in the past and even now to treat the agitations with greater civility have fallen on deaf ears. However, a recent pronouncement by the chief law officer of the country, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General Abubakar Malami, appear to suggest that the government might be uh, having some rethink or second thoughts as he says government is open to all possibilities and all kinds of solutions including political ones to resolve separatist agitations in the country this has been interpreted in some quarters to mean a resort to dialogue with the various groups a position which has been pushed for so long by uh, some individuals and organizations. In the minister's new line of thinking, that is, if his new line of thinking reflects that of the federal government, then there might be a silver lining in the sky. But what exactly is the, his definition and understanding of a political solution? How critical is dialogue to national development? What manner of dialogue is required and acceptable to all parties concerned? Who should be involved in the dialogue? 
is the option of engagement coming a bit too late in the day? How much impact will dialogue uh, now, if, if it happens now, have on the ongoing trials in Nigeria and in Benin Republic? Will dialogue guarantee a more equitable and just society for all? The 1999 Nigerian Constitution emphatically says Nigeria is an indivisible and indissoluble entity. With dialogue leads to the much talked about restructuring of the country. Will it end secessionist agitations now and in the future? And if not dialogue, what else? What are the other options that are open? to Nigeria, to the government, and to the agitators. Join us in our discussion when we return in a short while from this break. The Nigeria of our dream, the Nigeria we need, is the united, indisputable, and cohesive Nigeria which guarantees equity, fairness, justice, and prosperity for its citizens. That is our focus on people, politics, and power. It is fresh, insightful, it's a must watch. People, politics, and power on AIT. All right, thank you so much for staying with us. Let's get to meet our guest analysts today, two of them here with us in the studio. First, from my far left is Ambassador Sani Bala. Ambassador Bala is the Executive Director, Savannah Center for Diplomacy and Development. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Dr. viewers. Also joining us is Igo Akarega. Igo is the President, Civil Liberties Organization, CLO, and he's also the Abuja Bureau Chief of this Nigeria newspaper. Igo, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. Good afternoon, it's good to be here. Well, so Ambassador, let's, let's begin uh, with you. Thank you. Dialogue. How critical is it in nation building? It is very critical, actually, in the foundation of existence, peaceful existence of any community. Without dialogue, without understanding, and real negotiation, give and take, then there won't be mutual respect. There won't be understanding. There won't be cooperation and working together as one people. If you dialogue, then you know yourself what you want, and you know what your countryman wants. You know what it takes to make him happy or make him productive as you want. So anything that you don't dialogue, you don't understand each other, you are bound to have chaos. You are bound to have conflicts because all human endeavor they are working towards the resources, the natural resources that are there. Everybody wants to get a piece of it to make his or her life better. So you have to have understanding, cooperation, and the way to make everybody happy. I believe with dialogue, anything can be achieved. Dialogue in a country like ours, where, which is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, in fact, what is so many things? So many things, yes. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, it does appear that over the years, from independence, mm. we seem not to have taken the whole concept, uh, the way you have put it, the yes. whole concept of dialogue seriously. Because if we did, we probably would not have gone uh, on a 30-month civil war. We probably uh, would, would be a better country, a more progressive country than we are. So, how critical is this? Because we missed the point right before independence. If you look at the, all the constitutions before independence, were negotiated on behalf of Nigerians. Indeed, some Nigerians were identified, were selected and taken to London, and then, but the views and all the positions were already predetermined by the colonial masters. The input of our citizens, Nigerians, was just like, yes, just agreeing to. 
most of the positions, the fundamental positions. That is why we grew up in Nigeria, as I said somewhere, that it came as a nation that was born in fear and with fear. There was this predominance of suspicion. Each, each part of the country is feeling that it's going to be dominated by the other, either because of population or education or resources or whatever. The fear is there. It is prevalent everywhere. And if you are working in fear, you are incapacitated because you have to take a lot of your resources to get rid of that fear before you move forward. And almost, almost part of the whole part of the country, the fear is there. That has been with us for some time. We have to make sure that we deal with fear and then live together. The best way is you dialogue. Because some of the things that we fear are just perceptions. We have to know the extent of what is it that we fear. Then we now accommodate it and we make sacrifice. And we know that the other party is also making sacrifice. We have to make sacrifice and we know the levels. So we'll be moving with full understanding of each other. But the way we are now, everybody with his own perception and his own feelings and his own ideas going here and there. That's why we are clashing. But I believe if we sit down and articulate all the issues one by one, then we'll be able to identify the areas of collaboration. And those fault lines will downplay them. But unfortunately, there are some, some individuals across the country, maybe they have something to, to benefit from taking advantage of the, of the situation. But we have to make sure that those who are for unity are the ones that are involved in negotiations. Nico, why, do, why does it appear that um, many of our political elite in Nigeria, from independence until now, uh, seem to be averse to the genuine concept of dialogue? You see, there are, first I must say that Nigeria is a very beautiful country. Um, I have um, had to attend different events and fora where there have been all kinds of, uh, for me, I call them fraudulent arguments, that the North is against the South and the South is against the North. There's, those are just, uh, those are euphemistic words to hide uh, the realities on ground. Now, um, there are two classes in a society, the upper class and the lower class. Now, who are those that constitute the upper class? It is those who seek to sustain the current order of inequality and injustice. That's what constitutes the upper class. And then the lower class, usually they are the, those we call the talakawas, the ordinary people, and they are the working class. The working class usually constitutes the bulk of the majority of agitators who wants a fair play, who wants some level playing field, who wants some kind of injustice and equity. But for those who are benefiting from the unjust system, they, they fight very hard to sustain that status quo. That is, that is the struggle, that is the, the, the struggle for and contestation for power in societies. And that is what we have in Nigeria, which unfortunately so. Now, uh, Ambassador Bala uh, uh, mentioned some things that are of interest to me, and I completely agree with him. The root cause of crisis in nations across the world, if you look at the history of the First World War, the Second World War, the, the Bosnian War, former Yugoslavia, most recently the, the, the war in, in Syria, where uh, President uh, Assad you know, uh, refused to listen to dialogue. Just a few persons were protesting on the streets. They were calling for equity and justice, and they were calling for an end to military and police brutality in the state. And Assad rolled out the tanks against them. That was what led to the formation of the Free Syrian Army. And the rest is history. War broke out in that, in that country. If you also look at our own local example in Nigeria, when the Civil War was declared in 1967 by the late uh, Dumego Juku, after they, they fought up to a point, and then the need for dialogue arose. And they went to Ghana, the Aburi Conference. We all know what that is. If, that, if the outcome of the Aburi Conference was adhered to by all the parties, I'm sure more lives would have been saved. And I'm sure the, the country would have forged ahead, perhaps much more better than where, where we are today. So for me, the current separatist agitation 
to, to, to move away, maybe to, 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 to move away from the country, to create some kind of independence for, for nations, for the sub-nations that makes up the country, are all a combined product of passive injustice and oppression. And what has led to it, if you look at two operating words in the Constitution, uh, we are told that Nigeria is indissoluble and, and indivisible. And indivisible. Mm. For me, those two words are not only fraudulent, but they are criminally oppressive. When you say, for example, I, do not, I have never seen a union of people. Don't forget, Nigeria, Nigeria comprises of more than 250 ethnic groups. Now, we are living together with the understanding that we, we understand ourselves we are, we are going to share this country on the basis of fair play and equity. Now, but when you insert that kind of uh, proviso in the constitution that it is indissoluble and it is uh, indivisible. indivisible, that it was, what it suggests is that whether you like it or not, whether you are dissatisfied at any point, you must remain in the union. The recent example is the United Kingdom. UK. We saw Northern Ireland, the Sinfin movement in Northern Ireland. Mm. You know, uh, it, it was dialogue that at some point the British government had no choice that to grant some uh, level of loose federation and autonomy to, to the Sinfin movement. We have Northern Ireland in the Irish Republic. Uh, that was uh, the Irish Republican Army, and today we have uh, Ireland as a country of its own. So, for me, the solution to all of this, basically and very clearly, is we must first insist that the question of indissolubility and uh, indivisibility of Nigeria must be removed. And if we, we must ask to also as a country, the question of ethnicity, religion, and all of that must be removed from the Constitution. I'm seeing the attempt to review the Constitution. But the core issues that she's on the very foundation of the lives of the ordinary people of Nigeria, they, 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 it's about like, over it. How do you feel a form as a Nigerian citizen? How you have your religion, the language you speak, the state of origin, the state of origin and all those kinds. Those are divisive. Those demands are by themselves very divisive. And those are the fault lines that I think that the system, the, the, the system in Nigeria is seeking to, to deepen rather than resolve. It is only a national dialogue that can resolve uh, a lot of these questions. So, uh, again, the, the question arises, Ambassador, what yeah. kind of national dialogue should we be looking at? The expectation generally was that where yeah. our representatives at the uh, legislative arm of government, at, at the federal level, who represent constituencies, smaller uh, uh, constituencies, senatorial districts and all of that, would, should be able to push through some form of dialogue. But that hasn't happened. And everyone is talking about dialogue. Let, let's talk. Let's sit down and, and talk over our problems and uh, the various issues that seem to separate us. Yes. So what kind of national dialogue should we be looking at? Are we talking of another national conference? Uh, because we, we had one in, in 2014. Had mm. uh, we had a number before then. Mm -hmm. They all seem not to have produced the expected results. Yes. Actually, what we know is a whole, it's a holistic dialogue. If I may digress a little bit, if you look at the selection process, leadership selection process in this country, the crop of legislators that we have now, you look at how they came, how they were elected. They are through a skewed system. All the political parties were guilty of imposition. They are guilty of just picking people and imposing them on people. They are guilty of so many bad practices, bad practices in the, in the electoral system. So how can you say now, I don't think the people really have the confidence that the current leaders in the National Assembly can really get their agitations resolved. So we need a different platform. Quite all right, constitutionally, it has to be through the National Assembly and so on. But since these agitations have been going on, have you seen any, any, any part of the country that now asks its representatives to pursue their, their, their demands? Everybody is claiming uh, being marginalized. Everybody is claiming being ignored. Everybody is claiming being uh, uh, denied so many, so many things in the, uh, in the administration. But the right way to go is through your representatives. So that let the representative, you call them to order, you 
tax them. But what we have seen now in the last several years, nobody is going through that path. So we need to have an open-ended, uh, not let it open, uh, a larger uh, area that you can bring in so many people, the youth organization, the women organization, the market women, traders, so many. Let them come, let them talk, let them say what they want. Let them really know. And by the time everybody understands, ah, the people from the South House, they have problem of degradation. Yes, it's a real problem. So they cannot get food. Here in the North, you have big land so we can grow food. Why don't we now arrange and then make it easy for, for each other? Instead of, ah, no, 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 if you bring these people, they'll come and dominate us like this. All these fears, we should remove them. And the best way to do that is to be talking with each other. Not talking to each other. Get what I'm saying? Oh, at each other. We just start throwing, throwing bad words and hate speech and so on. But real constructive engagement that we bring out our, 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 our problems, bring out our demands, we negotiate. Yes, okay. You check the constitution. All those uh, relevant aspects of the constitution, you move. And they have a new one that will accommodate and mitigate all these uh, problems. I believe it goes beyond just the National Assembly. Mm. It has in both other parts, uh, civil society, especially civil society organizations. Because government has failed so far. All the uh, conferences that we have had, 2004, 2000, 2014, they are all there. None has been implemented. But I believe with civil society organization, we can, we can get up and bring all the reports, bring out all the recommendations, and then now galvanize the public to make sure that government implements those good uh, recommendations. I believe that's uh, what I feel. Igo, in the last six years, six, mm. to six and a half years, it, it appears, and I mean, it's, it's a fact that uh, uh, separatist agitations have gathered more momentum mm -hmm. than it was before 2015. And where, like mm -hmm. Ambassador has put it, everyone and every session of this country claims one form of marginalization or the other. Mm -hmm. Everyone is agreed by one thing or the mm -hmm. other. Government does not seem to be uh, listening or sympathetic to those agitations. And it also appears that the so-called elders of society have failed in their responsibility in helping to bring together these disparate groups and um, uh, leaders of thought to say, let us sit down and see what we can do and have a better society. So in the last six years to so six and a half years, it's been one form of agitation or the other. It's either from the south south, from the south east, from the middle belt, what have you? I mean, more and more groups are springing up every day with various demands. You see, let me, let me make this point very quickly. A lot of people uh, have blamed uh, the current president, President Mamadou Buhari, that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, he has failed, as it were, to implement the 2014 Confab, Confab report. But my point is this. If you look at the trajectory from 1999, once the military handed over to uh, civilians in 1999, Nigerians, Nigerians who felt dissatisfied all along, because under the military, they were more like a jackboot uh, form of administration. They would not brook any nonsense. They would not even brook any public protest. protest. Some of us were in the streets in Lagos, in Yaba, with the late uh, Chief Ganifawa and me, Femi Falana. So many of them were inside Bakuba. You know, it was actually the civil society groups that mobilized heavily along with the uh, labor movement you know, to chase uh, the military away from uh, the political space. But, but the civil society themselves were not organized enough to also occupy the political space, strategic positions. So it is uh, the, the, the political class who are just waiting in the wings, who have been obnobbing with the military all along, uh, in business with them, in cahoot with them, that saw this space, Akiti they had the resources, and they were able to move And that is where our own problem also then began as a uh, yeah, civil society group. Now, under former President uh, uh, Obasanjo, there were agitations. The agitations moved on to the era of uh, Yaradwa, 
the later Adwa, who of course is a great statesman, he was able to, and that was when the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, that was at the peak of their own agitation in the Niger Delta, yeah, kidnapping of expatriates and all of that, crippling of the oil sector, and we all saw the, how that affected uh, the, the, the economy of the country. But here Adwa, being a statesman, he was able to meet, he evolved uh, a process of dialogue, he engaged the militants flew some of their leaders to Abuja, discussed with them, and uh, an agreement was reached. And that brought peace to the Nigeria Delta. So from about uh, at the peak of the crisis, Nigeria was doing 200, uh, uh, 2 million barrels of crude. Oh, it dropped to about 650 to 700. But by the time President Yara moved in, uh, it then peaked again to about 1.8, 2, mi 2 million. So that is the, the effect and the importance and advantage of, of, of dialogue. Now, we moved on from there to the Jonah Tantera. The pressure continued. With men off the scene, other groups came up. We have the Odua People's Congress and several other groups came up. Uh, Boko Haram was also there from 12, 20, uh, 2004 2009. or 2009, 2009 and all that. Yeah. So, uh, President Jonathan was happy to deal with that. It was at a point they were even in Abuja. He, he, he designed a dialogue process. I remember... Uh, uh, People like Wole Shoinka, people like even at the point, this current president Muhammad Ubari was nominated to also speak for some of the groups, mm -hmm. you know. And there were dialogue. I think it broke down at some point. It was then that President Jonathan then felt okay, he's going to put in place a national dialogue. That was what uh, gave birth to the uh, 2014, 2014 National, 2014 national Conference. Mm -hmm. And a report came out. A report was made. But of course, he, he just had. Uh, five years or so, and he, had, he handed over to the current administration. But it, government should be a continuum. One would have thought that with, um, with the APC promising change and that they were going to restructure the country, uh, they were going to provide security and some other key operating ways, which convinced Nigerians that uh, the ruling party was going to do this differently from the PDP. And uh, they were voted into power. But even the very minimum issue of restructuring. We are not saying restructuring means dissolving the country and allow all the component uh, parts to go there. We know restructuring touches on the very root and fundamentals of citizens' existence. Because if, as a southerner, I cannot engage, you know, um, engage comfortably with the northerner, if we are looking at, at ourselves with the prism of suspicion as the ambassador, then we are not we are not one as a country. Why is I? America is great today. America is great today because once you get to the United States, there's equity and justice. They deliver it to you without you even having to ask for it. It is, it is almost an autopilot. It runs on its own. You are entitled to certain rights and privileges mm -hmm. as an American citizen. And that's how it should be in Nigeria. What Na Nigerians are not asking for too much. So for the agitators in the uh, Southwest, the uh, Old War, uh, Republic agitators, uh, IPOB and all of that, all these are a product, of, a product of dissatisfaction. People are just dissatisfied. And the government is not listening. If the government is listening, if today President Buhari convokes a national dialogue and says, okay, bring Igbo to Abuja, go and bring uh, Nambi Kano. I want to meet the, uh, the key leaders of this uh, agitation. Let's, let's hear them out. I'm sure a lot of this tension will come down. But when you give the impression that you, you, you have the machinery of the coercion of state power, then, of course, people will also say that we are living in modern times to procure uh, weapons of uh, violence. We also talk about porous borders. These things are common. So, non state actors are already also beginning to occupy the public space and challenging state actors to say, look, you cannot, you cannot continue to monopolize power at our own disadvantage. Oh, we can yes. also challenge you. Yes. And that is why we are having a lot of uh, national discomfort at all levels. The divisions and the uh, anger of some of these groups, Ambassador, have become very deep-seated yes. in, the, in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, have they gone so far that we cannot redeem the situation? What for you would be an ideal dialogue template that would be acceptable to all the groups that are at the moment very uh, uh, angry and dissatisfied within Nigerian system. I don't think the situation is irredeemable. It can be redeemed. But there must be justice and equity, yeah. whatever you do. You see, people must have trust in government. Government must make people trust it. Yeah. Once people don't trust government, definitely there will be failure. Why 
Is it that people don't trust government? It's because there is no justice, no equity, no fairness. Imagine, just remember the, the, the composition of the last uh, uh, national conference. There was too much agitation there. No, no, you have so many Christians, you have so many Northerners, you have so many youth, you have this, you have that. All these are issues that are going, can be addressed. If we are going to convoke a national conference, we must make sure that the platform, the structure, is one that is acceptable to the majority of the people. Make sure it is all inclusive, it is equitable and fair. If you go that way, definitely you have solved the problem 50%. Because the foundation of the whole thing is that we don't trust each other. We don't trust each other. But once you have you bring something, a structure that can build trust, then from there we move on. You have cooperation, you have understanding, you have, you have sacrifice. Therefore, these uh, groups and agitation, they keep on metamorphosing because there has not been response. Government has been mute or ignored, whatever, or considering, as it were. But it has taken very long time in this consideration. Things like this, they need urgent attention. You must show that, yes, you are responsive and you are responsible. But the moment you keep quiet, you ignore. You think that you just, the problem will take care of yourself. You are deceiving yourself. We have to wake up and face these challenges, bring out a structure that will address every aspect of the, of the, of the problems. There are to at least give people the confidence that, yes, we are now serious and we want to be fair to all. So for you, this, the style of this government mm. in keeping quiet or hoping that the problem will go away on its own it's has not worked. It's defeatist. You can see it. Every day you are seeing new forces coming up. And the old ones are still emphasizing, strengthening their positions and are calling for real division. You look at the, and it don't take much. All you need to do is come down, sit down. What is it that is uh, important? Let me take the issue of tax, for instance. Revenue generation. Some states may say, okay, I don't want tax on this, but other states will have to tax on so many others. Federal government is the biggest tax uh, collector. But in other areas, if you sit down with states, look, instead of federal government to take tax on this, states, go and take them. That will build them down. They will have their revenue coming to them directly instead of appropriating everything. And then even the responsibilities, you can divest some, you can devolve to the states and then the states to the federal to the, city, to the local government and make sure that they work. But in a situation where the political arrangement is skewed, definitely we cannot succeed how to be open and sincere even in our political arrangement in elections we have to make sure that people elect the people they want not in position not just uh, given the cronies and the uh, houseboys of uh, uh, political uh, leaders all right so let's take a short break we'll return in a moment are critical germane to nigeria's democratic process politicians can only be seen maybe on television by judges. They should not intermingle. Because once you intermingle, then you destroy the system. When the personalities are big, important to national discourse. When you reach certain stage in power and you demonstrate arrogance to the stream, there's no other thing that will happen to you or to fall. When the developments are seemingly complex, confounding like a thousand piece jigsaw that's when we require bold sound and analytical mind to help put the pieces together jigsaw with benga arileba now showing tuesdays and thursdays at 1 p.m on ait jigsaw demystifying the issues Thank you so much for staying with us. Igo, we, we, we run a federal system of government. At least that's what our constitution, the 1999 constitution says. 
And in, in a federal system of government, there ought to be more of cooperation than of antagonism the way we are going today. Now, if we were to look at this whole concept of political solution to the current crisis of uh, separatist movements and all of that, uh, because as it, as it is now, it appears to me, I may be right or wrong, that the federal government is beginning to come around a bit, to, to, uh, although late in the day, to see that this is the step you ought to have taken from the world go. And perhaps we will be in a better place than we are at the moment. Now, what, what can be achieved between now and 2023 in terms of uh, political solution to the current crisis? Don't forget that some of these agitators are already on trial, are in prison, both in Nigeria and outside of Nigeria. What would be the kind of template you would suggest, you would put on the table to say, okay, in order to have a meaningful dialogue, meaningful discussions, a good understanding of where we want to be, what, what is that template? Well, there are a lot of templates that uh, anyone with the right political will can adopt to resolve you know, the emerging challenges. But my worry basically is uh, the ruling class that I see now, the ruling class led by President Muhammadu Buhari, I do not think that um, they are interested in, in having these issues resolved. Rather, we, we are behaving as if we are a country of ostriches, burying our heads in the sand and then pretending that all around us is well. Right in Cameroon here, you have the Ambazonia uh, forces who are also seeking independence from mainstream uh, French dominated, uh, French speaking uh, dominated uh, Cameroon. So, for me, if you, if you are seeing the signs, including what happened during the Arab Springs, that way, if you look at the entire North Africa, they had some stable form of governance for about 200 years. Apart from our Sadat of Egypt, who at some point he was removed, and all of that. If you look at Algeria, some of that, they had some f major stability. In West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and the, uh, Liberia and all that had witnessed a lot, a lot of turbulence, particularly under the military era, with a lot of coups and counter-coups. So the point I'm making here is, we pretend that we are a federal, we are a federated unit, a federal government, and all of that. What are the components and characteristics of a country practicing true federalism? You need to have a state police, you need to have your independent judiciary, independent legislature, and all of that. Apart from maybe customs, duties, finance, and army, and all that, we should be in the exclusive list. All others should be on the concurrent list. And the states, the states will have their own uh, Supreme Courts, as we have in the United States. You know. So, that when you devolve power sufficiently, center. So, what we're having today, because whether it's under the military, because between 1966 and 1972, we practiced clearly a unitary system of government. And so, when the military came in, they still began, they pretended as if they are pursuing some form of pseudo democracy. And then they said, oh, now is federal government and all. But all the key components of a unitary system of government is retained within the current federal structure that we have. Such that we have only one Supreme Court in Abuja here, in 36 states of the Federation. And that is why I was checking the last figures. We have about 20,000 cases unresolved at the Supreme Court. Because what, how many, how many judges, uh, justices do you have at the Supreme Court to resolve all of these matters? So we are going to continue to take two steps uh, forward and 10 steps backward as a country if we fail to develop power, if we fail to genuinely restructure. So, uh, in another, in, uh, President Buhari still have about two years. In fact, a leader with the right political will can do a lot in six months. Yes. The current, uh, the APC controls the Senate and the House of Representatives. It takes the president to send an executive bill to the National Assembly to say, look, this is what I want. Call the principal officers to. to to the villa and brief them. And I'm sure the country will make uh, giant strides, even in six months, if there's a political way. Without first consulting with the cons constituent units and the various sections of the country, no. uh, as to know exactly what is acceptable to them. The, what is acceptable is already known. What, is the, what are the demands of the agitators? What are, what are the basic demands in the north? 
Because when people say that if my if somebody from my region holds power, then we are free, we will enjoy it. It's not true. It's Over not time, true. We, evidence have shown that when somebody from your village is the president, it does not mean you are going to start enjoying. When President uh, Obasanjo was representing the Southwest and Yorubas was president, the Yorubas didn't enjoy. They were also agitated. When President Gulo Jonathan from, uh, from, from my own region, the South South, became president, that was even when agitations grew. You know? So, and the Southwest was underdeveloped. The East-West Road was not constructed. So many things, the, 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 the Niger Bridge and all of that, so many things were not done. Now, President Buhari, who comes in from, from the North, from Casina State, we all know what is happening in Casina today. So it is foolhardy for anybody to think that because the, if the president comes from your place, then you are, you, is Edorado, you are not going to enjoy it. It's not true. So it is time for all Nigerians to join us, whether from the South, East, West, and North. We need to join us and agree on our common demands. What are basically the common demands? To resolve the question of poverty and hunger, unemployment, justice, Security. security and all of that the nigerians are not asking for so much once you can your child a poor man's child can attend the same school with that of uh, you know a rich man everybody is going to be happy but when the poor man is sick in this country you die of even malaria and all that but when the elites are sick they have privations they fly off the u.s and uk to treat themselves including mr president he does that even though he, he said he was not interested in uh, medical tourism but we have seen so far since you also imagine that uh, he has been at the forefront of also quickly jetting out to go and take care of uh, himself. So the ruling elite do not want to die. They, they want to stay alive and continue to oppress the rest of us. So but the point is, if you fail to put in place the right structures, the system will also consume everybody at some point. Because there will be an internal implosion at some point that nobody will be able to control. What you mm -hmm. see in the not today, when people say Boko Haram, Boko Haram is some form of resistance, you know, couched in other, in other kinds of languages. What you also see in uh, IPOB, and uh, Yoruba agitation. These are, these are people who are seeking to have some form of fair treatment at the center, and they are not getting it. And it is going to get worse. My fear is that by 2023, if President Buhari does not address the issues, by 2023, when a new president comes, and people see that this man, if particularly if the president does not come, does not emerge from a credible leadership recruitment process, as Ambassador said earlier, if he's somebody first on the rest of the country, they will not will probably not be sitting down here discussing whether we are practicing true federalism or, or unitarism. Mm. Well, I, I'm asking though, yes. uh, supposing mm. uh, this is hypothetical, okay. supposing the president today mm. decides to convoke some kind of dialogue, do you think that that alone would um, help to lessen the tension? that appears to be so much across the country today. Will it assuage the anger and the tension that we see in people from different, uh, from different parts of the country at the moment? It will if the platform is fair, just, and all-inclusive. But once it is skewed, or it is marginalized. If some people still feel marginalized, definitely it will aggravate the anger. But I believe if Mr. President decides now to convoke the national conference, his, my advice to him is that let him engage the civil society organizations. All the civil society organizations in Nigeria should be his first port of call because they are the ones that will tell him the truth and will make sure that everything is done equitably, fairly, and with relevant justice. I believe majority of the civil society organizations that are operating in Nigeria, they are exposed every day. They are exposed to these fears, these agitations, more than even the government itself. Because sometimes uh, Mr. President may not know actually what is going down, down the ladder. But the civil society organizations, they are the ones who are working with the people day in, day out. They know the feelings, they know the, the real fears. What about the concern that these civil society organizations are also peopled by Nigerians who have yes. their own Indian secrecies and their own agenda to push? Definitely, if their own ethnic, their own, religious, their, whatever, their own agenda may not be different. It cannot be different from the agenda of all the other groups 
that are not civil society organizations. But those who are expressing these fears of domination, fears of marginalization and deprivation. My point is that they are more in contact with these agitators. They feel more about the feelings and the yearnings and aspirations of the agitators. I don't, I'm not saying that he should not uh, involve people in government, and, uh, but let him also give the civil society organization a place, a role, a big role to play in the creation of the platform so that we make sure that it is fair, it is just, and it is all inclusive. Once you, you do that, And definitely the majority of people will start feeling that negotiations, dialogue is give and take. You can't take everything and you don't give anything. You have to give and then you take. So once they know they are going to be involved, the tension will go down. And we should be frank and sincere. There must be sincerity in the conduct of the dialogue. It should not be skewed. It should not be uh, taken over. Do, do you like. see any uh, of that in in the personages in the people who are in government today you see some uh, resemblance of sincerity and frankness well uh, what i see there are very few there are very few that are very very sincere that can bring other people from outside the government currently are outside the government but there are so many of them who are sincere who are honest who are patriotic who can really make it happen. Out of the few that are in government, they will bring the rest who are outside the government. Majority of these good people are outside the government. I'm happy that the, uh, the Attorney General of the Federation is saying that yes, government is uh, amenable to political solution. A political problem needs political solution. So, which means the government is ready to partner and also give and take. So I believe the good people that are, that are capable of you know, controlling or conducting the, the conference honestly and sincerely, they are there. There are so many of them. Yeah. All parts of Nigeria, you can get them. Uh, Igo, do, do you think that in this regard, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice can be trusted? We, we know that from time to time, government officials speak from both sides of the mouth. With profound respect, I, I, I do not think that the, this attorney general that we have now, that he can be trusted. Um, we have had to engage him at different fora, and if you look at his activities since he, since he became attorney general minister of justice, he seems to be pushing the position more of the, elite, of the elitist class than, the, the, than, than issues that would benefit the majority of the people. So if you are pushing a class interest that is seemingly narrow, then people are naturally going to be dissatisfied. Now, if the Attorney General is also saying that the government is, is disposed to a political solution, for me, I see that as political rhetorics, political convenience, to give some semblance of hope that is non-existent. Nigerians are tired of hoping against hope that something is going to happen. Something is going to happen the next month. And it doesn't happen. So when you give hope to people and they wait for a while, why, why? look at the NSAS protest, how the Nigerian youth poured into the streets. It is because they waited for about four years of the Buhari administration that maybe this press, look, President Buhari and maybe if I can remember very well, uh, uh, the late uh, Moshu Kashima Walawale Abiyod, I think it is these two of them and the ones that has had the most popular votes across the country in terms of emerging as president uh, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Abiola secured votes, massive votes from the north, from the south, from the east and west. So it is also with Buhari, and that was why he was able to rewrite history by being the first, uh, first candidate 
you know, to remove a sitting president, to remove a Nigerian sitting president. So I thought that he was going to quickly catch in on that. In a democratic big advantage. election. Yes, mm -hmm. in a democratic mm -hmm. election. Catch on that advantage mm -hmm. to quickly t uh, ma make certain decisions that, uh, you know, will stabilize all sections of the country. But uh, I, I think many people are a bit disappointed. It's not too late because he himself has recognized it. He has said that. He was not going to, he's not going to hand over power in 2023 as a, as a president that uh, failed. So he's going to take the necessary steps also ensure that he delivers on some of his key promises. We are waiting to see him do that. He's in France now. I think he has traveled to South Africa. To South Africa, Africa. South Africa. All of that. For me, looking for the funds is good. But first, stabilize your home front. Make sure there's security. Citizens are happy. Then naturally, foreign investors will come. You don't go begging them to come. They will come to you when you have made yourself into a beautiful bride. So for us, by way of a resolution of all of it, it is simple. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who turned around the fortunes of Singapore, was an old man, a 70-year-old man. He was president at some point. He left handed over. The people took, who took over power from him messed up Singapore. And Singaporeans became a laughing, laughing stock, you know, in the, among, the, uh, among the Asian tigers. And he promised that he was coming to transform Singapore. And today, Singapore is one of the best countries in Asia. So is China, too, uh, with President Xi Jinping. To the extent that the Chinese people, on their own, voluntarily, said that he should become their life president. That is the satisfaction of a people with a leader. When the tension, Confucius, a Chinese philosopher, said that when the tension of a leader is good, eh, that the people themselves will be good. That means if he comes to power, he begins to deliver justice, equity, and, and good governance, and the people will be happy, and the people will be good. That is one of the key philosophies of Confucius. And I think that is very important that Nigerian leaders learn from it. And they really don't have too much time, because the youth do not have the kind of patience yeah. that uh, the old brigade have. The youth, this is a digital world. At, at the press of a body, you are going to get information. They know what is happening. You can't deceive anybody anymore. So when you come with uh, policies of deception, you saw what happened in the Anambra election when a woman was to be given visit five thousand naira with her, and she rejected it. That you know we don't want this money, and uh, uh, you know the, the governor has just rewarded the woman I think with about one million naira. That is the that is the way Nigerians should go. Okay. Yeah, that is very yeah. important. Uh, Ambassador Balao, yes. on a final note, what are your hopes? My hopes for Nigeria is that. We ourselves should be able to create an atmosphere of understanding, cooperation, and unity. And we should drive the project to ourselves. The youth, I believe, are the real champions. They have this responsibility. The old guard, I can say, will have failed, but the youth. You have the future of Nigeria in your hands. If you go violent way, you will destroy Nigeria and you will destroy yourselves. But if you go by dialogue, understanding, cooperation, and inclusiveness, we'll have a better Nigeria. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Sani Bala is the Executive Director of Savannah Center for Diplomacy and Democracy. Development. Thank you so much for joining us. And Igo Akarega is the president of Civil Liberties Organization, CLO, and the Abuja Bureau Chief of this Nigeria newspaper. Thank you, Igo, for joining us. Thank you very much. Right. For That's our program for today. Please join us again when we bring you a fresh edition of People, Politics, and Power. Bye for now. Thank you so much for your patience to watch from the beginning to the end. I hope you have learned something from the video you have just watched. The video you have just watched is to bring information to your doorstep and for educational purpose. It is not to demonize anybody. Let us watch continuously and see who can be able to make a sense out of every nonsense we are seeing. We must continue. We move. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say. They will kill us. We will kill them. At the end of the day, Biafra is here. Thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please kindly subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell so that you notify each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you and remember us. Bye bye. See you again. <laughs>